we're talking this afternoon about um, the science of the creative mind. And to me, the most fascinating thing about the mind and the brain, really, is that it creates and recreates itself through our whole lives. Um, we've heard a bit about how there are set periods in our lives when the brain is doing more changing, but it, this never really stops. It changes at the level of brain cells and the connections between them through our whole lives. It's called neuroplasticity, or plasticity to its friends. And it's, it's something that happens, changes what the brain does. But what I wanted to do is to try and put this feature of the brain to good use on my own brain. I mean, there's not a huge amount wrong with it, per se, but there are certain things through life um, that have come in through experience or genetics or, or whatever, or things that I've learned, that it might be quite nice to tweak, if at all possible. And the, mo the main thing that I wanted to start with was my attention or, and focus, or lack of it, um, for two reasons. Um, one, most of the research in this area, we know that plasticity only works if you focus your attention on something for a decent amount of time. Um, attention is the brain's way of working out what to hold on to, what to store, and what to just discard and, and just to not worry about. And the second reason is because it's never really been my strong suit. When I was a kid, uh, a long-term friend of mine um, hit the nail on the head, and he said, you are such a butterfly brain. And he meant by that that I always start things really enthusiastically, and I really delve in, but it's not long before my mind wanders somewhere else, and I get distracted, and I leave what I was doing, and I find myself over there. And it's never been a massive problem in life. I kind of got through school and uni okay. But there came a point, sort of within the last couple of years, where my work patterns changed. And rather than having an eight-hour day where you can build in a bit of faffing around and, and mind-wandering time, I now had to work around my young son and do like two or three hours at a time. So when I was working, I needed to get on, do it, nail it, and do something else. And the butterfly was not helping that at all. You know, no sooner as I got started, I was making tea or looking on Facebook or, or whatever. And I'd end the day stressed and frustrated and, um, and with even more work to do the next day. And while I was banging my head off the, the desk one day, I remembered um, these guys, uh, not those guys, that's me, these guys, um, Joe DeGutis and Mike Esterman. Now, they are neuroscientists at Boston uh, Attention and Learning Lab in Massachusetts. And they work with people who have a lot worse problems focusing than I do. Um, people, they work in a, a military hospital um, with returning uh, military vet war veterans who have problems with post-traumatic stress disorder, um, maybe brain injuries. Um, they also work with stroke patients and people with attention deficit disorder. And they come up with a combination of computer-based training and brain stimulation, which is what they're playing with here, that seems to help these people improve their ability to focus. And not just in the lab, but also in um, everyday life as well. So I said, great, do you think you can do this to me? And being good scientists, they said, probably not. But they humoured me anyway and sent me um, a link to a website where there's, there's various um, experiments. You can go to this testmybrain.org and, um, and try some stuff out. Um, so I did a continuous concentration test. And this spits out a score. Uh, and at the end, it says, it tells you where you stand um, compared to other people. And it said to me, you scored better than zero out of every 10 people that did this test. At which point they said, if you'd like to come to Boston, we'll see what we can do. So a month later, I found myself in this room, which is a, a, an unused hospital room that they've put a, what looks like a torture chair in the middle. And that's where they're going to zap my brain um, with their magnetic um, stimulator. But before that, they had to do a load of tests to find out what the problem was. Um, now, one of the tests that they did um, was, all, this took about two hours, this whole testing process, and they quickly established that I probably don't have ADHD, which is something we'd all been wondering about, being that I had this such awful school. But based on their tests, probably not. But I did still have problems with the sustained attention task. Now, just to de describe what that's like, this is Betty. Um, they nicknamed the test Don't Touch Betty, and that's because you have a series of faces flash up at you on the screen every second or so. As soon as you see a male face, you press the button. If you see Betty, she's the only female, you don't touch Betty. And it's really hard to describe how frustrating it is. It takes 12 minutes, but it feels like a lot longer. And I could feel my hand going for the button, and I knew I shouldn't be touching, but a gun to my head could not have stopped me pressing that button. And it felt a lot like sitting at my desk, with a paper to read and not being able to get my brain to focus on the page. It was so frustrating. 
And sure enough, my scores came back. And um, this is me in the red, the score there. So I, I scored worse than the worst healthy person they'd ever tested on this. And I was sort of edging towards the kind of people that they treat with have brain injuries and PTSD. Uh, <laughs> and at this point, they started to look a bit worried because their normal intervention um, is eight weeks long. And you know they take their time, and they really train people, and they zap them every week. They had, at this point, um, four and a half days uh, to work with me. So there was no time to lose. They sent me down um, to the MRI scanner, which wasn't a pirate ship. I was gutted about that. But um, they wanted to take a picture of my brain. So here is my brain. Um, so the two things they were interested in, really, the top one here is the um, in the blue. That's three different views of what's called the dorsal attention network. Um, and that's the parts of the brain that spring into action when you are deliberately focusing on something. So in order for that to work, you need to turn down activity in the bottom rainbow one there, um, which is the uh, default mode network, which is, I think of as the mind-wandering network. It's what kind of, it's what happens when we're not thinking about anything in particular. Your mind's wandering, you're being creative, you know, it's just channeling away in the background. And the idea behind this approach that they've developed is that somewhere in between these two extremes is what you want. So you, you don't want to engage the um, attention network so, so hard that you get exhausted and you can't sustain it for long. But you also don't want to be so back in your mind-wandering network that you're not concentrating on what you're doing. Being in the zone is about being in the middle ground. So you can see in the middle top one there, they've got like a, a, a cross over an area of the brain. That's um, part of the... Um, the, the dorsal attention network. And what they wanted to do is turn down the left side. I know it looks like the right, but it's the way the picture is flipped. Um, turn down activity in the left side of this network to force me to use the right. And the right side is the more efficient network for this particular task. So the idea is like strapping down the arm that you, you use all the time to make you force, force you to strengthen the one that you don't use. And if you've ever wondered what it's like to be zapped in the head with an electromagnet, um, there it is. And basically, it feels like somebody flicking you in the head quite hard once a second for eight minutes. So it doesn't exactly hurt, but it's uh, a little bit annoying. And there's my brain. And then after that, the idea of that was to, to supercharge the training so that it was forcing me to use my weaker bit. Um, and the training was very similar to Don't Touch Betty, only so you had a target that you don't press for, everything else you do press for. But the difference being that they could um, twiddle a few knobs and make it easy enough but challenging enough that you're in that middle zone. And with brain training, like with training anything, it's about practice and repetition because your brain will default to the circuits that are most efficient and the ones you've used most often. So you're strengthening that and then the idea is that they tweak it, make it a little harder, make it harder, and eventually you get a nice strong um, zone uh, of concentration in your brain that you, can that you can use whenever you want to. It took them a while to, to get me into the zone. They were looking even more worried by Wednesday. I was only there until Friday. Um, but eventually, it got to the point where not only did my score improve from like 11% correct to 70% correct, but what was more fascinating to me is it felt totally different. Once I'd got myself into that state, before I was had sort of white noise in, in my head and you know I, I couldn't concentrate and I wasn't really sure why, but it was driving me mad. By the time I got into the zone, I was, wasn't getting them all right, but when I did miss one and press when I shouldn't have been, I was kind of aware where my mind had wandered to. So I thought, oh, I was thinking what my son's doing at home, or, you know, I was wondering if there's any wine in the fridge, or, you know, and I could bring my brain back and get the next one. So it wasn't complete loss. And apparently that's, and that's known in psychology as meta-awareness. You're aware of what you're thinking. And that's quite an important thing, because if you want your mind to stop wandering too far, you need to be able to nudge it back before it goes too crazy. But we wouldn't really know if this had changed anything about my brain until the end of the week when I resat the Betty test and did exactly the same thing over, over and over again. So this is a reminder of me before, and this is me, the little red one, after. And this is just after four hours of training over the week and two sessions of the zapping. So I'd gone from being worse than the worst to better than average, and, um, and almost as good as the best healthy person they'd ever tested. And you could be a cynic and say, well, of course you've improved. You've been pressing buttons and not pressing buttons all week. It was a similar test. But they've quantified the practice effect, and they were expecting like maybe a 4% improvement based on other studies. I, I improved by 40%. So 
it seemed like quite a, a real effect. And I felt different. As, I felt different too. I felt very kind of calm. It felt pretty good, I have to say. And there was another um, measure that had nothing to do with pressing buttons. So the attentional blink test is basically a test of how quickly your brain can refocus after it's seen one stimulus in the order of like millisecond, hundreds of a um, second. Can you refocus onto something new? And my accuracy on that test um, nearly doubled as well. So the question, of course, is what happened? And um, we didn't do these tests in the brain scanner for the reason that in such a short period of time, you wouldn't see such meaningful change that you could actually point at it in a brain scanner. You know, that your brain doesn't work like that. It's not going to be a massive lump to look at. But we can look at um, previous studies and some of the tests that they did on me at the beginning of the week to see what, was, what the problem was and maybe what the training might have done to my brain. Now, one clue comes from one of the um, scales they asked me to answer on, which came out as very high score on impulsivity. So this explains why in the lab I had real trouble when my hand had started pressing the button, why I couldn't stop it. And it also explains why, if my mind's wandering, I have a really hard time thinking, you do not need a cup of tea, you need to read this paper and get back on track. The reason why that impulsive streak doesn't make me some kind of crazy hedonist that has a great time all the time and does no work is because I also scored high on conscientiousness. So I'm basically a bit of a swat who just wants to get the work done and wants to do the job properly. So there's a bit of a tug of war going on here. Um, yeah, I want to I wanna work, but I also don't want to work. I also... <laughs> I, you know that feeling, right? So um, there's also another thing that... that plays into all this, I scored high on trait anxiety, so I'm the kind of person that gets a bit wound up about stuff. And all this tug of war going on and all this makes me worried, and then, hey, presto, stress kicks in. And one thing we do know, do know about stress hormones that flood the brain is that they uh, bind to some of the dorsal attention network and turn it down, which kind of makes sense if you think about it. If you're in a stressful situation, you don't want to be just looking at one thing. You want to be looking around for the exits and, and finding out where to go next. But in this situation, it's not terribly helpful. What the training did is basically practiced being in the zone, strengthening the circuits of being relaxed and ready and in control, and it turned everything else down. It just allowed the swatty um, conscientious side to come out, which is great when you've got access to neuroscientists and brain zappers, but what if you don't? And now I don't. And the, the, the bad downside of adult brain plasticity is that you have to keep it going. It's like you can't go and do sit-ups for a week and then come home and slob about and expect your abs to stay firm. It won't happen. You have to keep this up. So what do I do? Well, luckily, there are a few things that have been shown in studies to work. Um, one uh, is, is me meditation. So there are studies, have been shown, studies have shown that long-term meditators have thicker areas of their brain associated with turning down the mind-wandering network and increasing focus. And, you know, obviously... That's what Buddhist um, monks have been doing for centuries, you know, increasing focus, turning down the wandering mind. It's what they do. I can't honestly put my hand on my heart and say I've been meditating every day since coming back from Boston, much as I would like to, but one thing I have been doing every, every day since um, has also been shown in studies to be useful. Spending time in nature. Even in lab studies, even somebody looking at a picture on a computer screen of a natural scene improves their attention um, better than looking at a cityscape or a blank wall or whatever. So this, it seems to suggest that taking my little uh, dog Django there out for a walk and stomp through the woods um, is actually going to restore my attention. And, and I have to be honest, the only time I feel as good as I did during that time in Boston is after I've come back from a muddy walk and I sit down and I can really get on with some work. But to me, there are two uh, take-home messages from all of this. Um, clearly, meditation and dog walking aren't for everybody, but... It, what seems to be true is that whatever you do that gets you in that relaxed and ready state of being in the zone, of being engaged but not stressed and being chilled out but not away with the fairies, the more you do that, the more that state will be there for you when you need it. So a quick survey of my friends and family, you know, there's all these kinds of ways, whether it's hanging off the side of a mountain or running or playing the guitar, it doesn't matter. Whatever you do, do it a lot. And the other take-home message for me was it wasn't actually that difficult to, with the right intervention to make a real change to the way my brain works and also the way I feel uh, and the way life appears to me. I felt like I had more time to do everything. Everything was a bit more chilled out. So now I've got a shopping list of everything that I want to change. So there's kind of 
there's quite a few things to work on. Um, I'll probably have to get back to you on them. But um, for now, um, thank you very much for paying attention to me.